Good to go. Okay, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many people at this uh, um, talk today, the Falkland Lecture today. Uh, I'm just going to show, um, let's say a few words of welcome um, about the um, there we go. I think I just have to click on the screen. So I wanted to kick off um, today uh, by saying a few words about uh, Ray Faulkner, whose name is who's the, who the, the seminar series named after. So, um, so some some of you may have met Ray. I think I think there's some people in the audience who have met Ray. I was, I was not lucky enough to be one of those. Um, so Ray was uh, often referred to as Mr. Weather. From his early days as a weather observer atop Mount Washington in New Hampshire to his work at the General Electric Research Laboratory in Nobel Laureate Irving Langmuir's Project Cirrus, Ray was an enthusiastic disciple of the atmosphere. In 1961, when Vincent Schaefer discovered the discoverer of cloud seeding established the Atmospheric Sciences Research Center, he hired Ray as its very, as its, as its very first member. From that time on, Ray's boundless energy was poured into public education on weather and the environment. His popular radio weather commentaries, his articles, and his lecture series made him widely known as the voice of the ASRC. So Ray started this series, uh, not here actually, but, but at, uh, at the White Face Mountain in the summer of 1962. And in 1973, expanded to a spring series here at UAlbany campus. So this is the 50th year, which is, we should do something. Um, so the series is deeply rooted in ASR's history and offers scientists a unique opportunity to engage with the public. And uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to take this opportunity to just very quickly say something about the center. Uh, I just want to highlight for those of you who are not familiar with ASRC, um, I just want to mention a few things. Actually, there's a drone on this figure. Um, so some of the areas that ASRC is well known for and continues to excel. Uh, we do a lot of work in renewable energy, really, uh, obviously, a global importance area of study, but also particularly in New York. Uh, generally, we work on weather and climate, which is where Ray was was uh, uh, was, was uh, excelling. Um, we do work on uh, observing and theory of boundary layer meteorology. Um, and a growing area of applications of atmosphere of AI and machine learning. Uh, we have an Excite laboratory where we have some super supercomputers doing AI kinds of research. Um, we also have a growing, a continued and, and expanding area working on air quality uh, and atmospheric chemistry, and um, also, uh, again, a growing area of work in uh, urban weather and climate. So these, so we work on observations, we work on theory, and uh, this we also strive to make this research uh, societally relevant. Um, just a few few items of uh, facilities and projects. We, we're very proud of the White Face Mountain. Uh, facility where we make measurements of clouds and atmospheric gases. Um, and um, we have a long history. We just had our 50th anniversary of uh, making observations of white face last semester. Uh, in terms of other facilities that we brag about, uh, I think this will be mentioned in today's talk. Um, we have the New York State Mesonet um, making observations around the state. And so this data gets used for multiple multiple things, including emergency management, energy, uh, air quality, and, and such. So there's a lot of uh, lot of energy in this area. Um, and uh, I, did, I didn't want to go past missing the Center of Excellence in Weather and Climate Analytics. This is a state-supported uh, endeavor um, to carry out re applied research in collaboration with private companies. So for the economic development and enhancement of New York State. And um, this picture actually is uh, of the podium of a solar array on the roof of the podium on the on the campus, which is looks like some Star Trek thing. Um, and uh, we all uh, very it's it's we've been here a year and a half now uh, in this so in the SeaTac building, and I just wanted to highlight some of the things I've already mentioned. But this building houses the Atmospheric Science Research Center, the New York State Mesonet Center of Excellence but also uh, the Department of Atmospheric and Environmental Sciences, um, the National Weather Service, which is also on, on the fourth floor, business development on this floor, uh, 
CHC, which is the College of Emergency Management, Homeland Security and Cybersecurity, which was in charge of the drone display outside. Uh, we also have environmental engineering and the Excite Laboratory, which is the, the, the high performance uh, AI computing infrastructure. So with that, uh, and if you have any more questions about the building or everything, anything that's going on in the building, particularly SRC, let, let me know. So let's move on to uh, introducing today's speaker. It gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Megan Conway. So Megan uh, is a meteorologist uh, working at the as the Director of Weather Systems and Projects at True Weather Solutions. Uh, she is a University at Albany DAS Graduate School alum. Since graduating from New Albany six years ago with her Master's in Atmospheric Science, she has worked as a Project Scientist and Weather Systems Manager for True Weather Solutions. And True Weather Solutions actually occupies some of the space on the first floor. Uh, as Director of Weather Systems and Projects, her current responsibilities include managing several NASA-funded programs and maintaining the effort to crowdsource different weather data sets into True Weather Software Solutions. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, Megan. Thanks. Hello. Hi, my name is Megan Conway. I'm the Director of Weather Systems and Projects at True Weather Solutions. I'm excited to be presenting here at the eTech Center. Um, we do have offices in the lower uh, the lower levels here. Um, so yes, a little background on me. As Chris mentioned, I am a meteorologist. I received my master's of science here at UAlbany. So I'm excited to be working here still in the Albany area in New York. Um, today I will be discussing who we are at True Weather Solutions uh, and the weather specific problems that we try to solve, namely addressing the weather pain points for the drone and advanced air mobility industries. So True Weather is a commercial weather company. Uh, we focus on providing targeted weather solutions tailored for drone operations. Uh, we are low altitude weather specialists who focus on micro data observation networks and services. We provide elevated weather intelligence from the ground up. So our focus is really in the lower parts of the atmosphere. Our mission is to decrease weather uncertainty for drone operators uh, as this uncertainty increases their costs and elevates their risks of operating these drones. So True Weather Solutions, we are located across the United States, um, but a large part of our workforce is here in New York State. Uh, we do have an office here in Albany um, and then also across the state in general. Um, why are we really focused in New York? Uh, New York State, uh, really the Mazinet, as Chris mentioned, they are leading the way on weather observation networks. Uh, it's a very innovative network and part of the reasons we came to New York. Uh, we're also here because of UAlbany. Uh, UAlbany has a lot of talent coming out of their department, um, talent that we would like to hire and use for our company as well. Uh, and then the COE and the startup program in New York. So the COE brings the research and the private, the public and private sectors together uh, and brings the research out of the universities and puts them out into the commercial areas. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? So the problem is, is that there is a lack of low altitude weather data observations and measurements. Um, this lack of low altitude uh, weather data measurements has a very big impact on drone operations, especially. And I'll get more into that in just a minute. Um, so we have a statement from the National Academy of Sciences report there on the left, or on the right, excuse me. Um, and it says the United States should establish a publicly chartered private nonprofit corporation to administer its network of networks. A hybrid public-private organizational model would stimulate both public and private participation, maximize data access, and synergize public good and proprietary interests. Uh, and so what they're talking about there is that there is a increasing need across the nation in the United States to have a better and more detailed weather observation network. Uh, New York State and the technology here coming out of eTech in New Albany is paving the way to address and fill those data gaps in the lower parts of the atmosphere. Uh, so again, what we're really focusing on with this problem is uh, that the fact that the lack of weather data observations and measurements in the lower parts of the atmosphere has a very large impact on the drone and unmanned aircraft industry. Uncrewed aircraft, drones or UAS as we call them as well, are very, very weather sensitive. Uh, without a pilot, some micro weather hazards in the air are actually unknowable. And the current aviation weather system is too coarse to address these needs. And so what is the impact? That means that there is a greater risk of accidents 
and that they have to make more conservative business decisions to reduce uh, their their risk and to uh, and their reliability as well. So the drone package delivery market is projected to grow from 228 million in 2022 to 5.5 billion in 2030. Um, and most businesses actually don't even recognize or prepare for the weather risks, uh, nor do they have an accurate view of how much risk there is with the weather uh, in the BV loss uh, drone industry. And the re reality is that weather is uncertain. And this uncertainty produces what we call a weather tax on the operations for drones. And this tax is higher on these operations due to the weather problems outlined here below. So drones, they are small aerial vehicles operated by operators on the ground with a remote. Uh, they're very sensitive to winds, uh, AGL, which is above the ground level, um, updrafts, downdrafts, turbulence. Um, eventually, these drones will have people on them, eVTOLs. They will carry people from airport to airport or from different areas, um, and they'll be very sensitive to turbulence and wind shear in the urban canyons. Uh, these drones are also very sensitive to icing. Um, and FAA rules mandate that they cannot fly within 500 feet of a cloud. Uh, so these drones are very, very uh, weather sensitive and the weather impacts uh, actually change depending on what type of drone, the size, the payload, and what it's carrying as well. So our current weather infrastructure across the United States and even across the globe leads to this really large weather gap below the 3,000, 5,000 foot level. Uh, so really from the ground up to that, that level. Um, and so how do we fill these gaps? These gaps really largely exist in rural and suburban areas and corridors, and even in urban areas and in cities as well. Uh, so to fill this gap, it'll require a blend of different sensors and capabilities. Uh, and the mesonet is a really big part in, in filling those data gaps. Sensor placement and density op optimization is also a key part for that. Uh, we need to make sure that these sensors are placed in the right areas to make sure that we're optimi optimally excuse me, sensing the weather um, that is necessary. So currently, 3% of the U.S. has good cloud height and visibility data, data coverage. That's just 3%. And there's even less data coverage for above ground level winds and icing. So MIT conducted a survey that stated 30% of crewed aviation flights are canceled or delayed due to weather when they actually could have flown. And this is expected to be higher rates for the UAS industry. Now, why is that? And that's because there's uncertainty in the weather about what is happening or what will happen above the ground level, um, specifically between the levels of the ground and up to 5,000 feet. And so what are these impacts on the UAS operations? It's recognized that the weather information for UAS operations may be different from the ones provided by today's meteorological service providers. So today, a lot of the meteorological services are provided for general manned aviation. So planes like American Airlines or Delta, um, or they're focused more on different sectors like the energy sector. Um, so drones, when you fly, with a remote pilot, you're actually flying weather blind, as we call it. Uh, so you actually can't see the winds that are occurring in the areas that you are flying your drone. In addition, the where you get your data is from METARS, which is essentially a, a surface observation that provides wind, temperature, and other data. And it's only representative of the location that the measurement is taken. So uh, these measurements and the observations that we have are very, very localized. And again, only 3% of the US has these cloud ceilings that are measured. So what is a real world incident that happened? We actually, uh, we provide forecasting services for a uh, some test ranges here in New York state. And a pilot followed all of the FAA rules and regulations and they got the winds using this, uh, what the handheld anemometer there, you can see it on the right, the yellow thing there. And what they do is they hold it up and, and they see what the winds are and they look at it. They say, okay, these winds are good, I can fly. And so they did, they flew their drone and they got hundred feet above the ground level and the drone lost control and it actually crashed. 
And so that kind of shows that there's an invisible threat lurking above the ground level in those areas. And you, you don't really know what's going on unless you have sensors uh, to tell you what is going on. So not only does this lack of low altitude observations impact the in-time operations, but they also impact meteorologists' ability to provide accurate forecasts to help plan out the drone, mis drone missions in advance. Uh, so let's say Amazon wanted to deliver a package with a drone, they would need to likely plan that in advance in order to do that, and they need a weather forecast to do that. So the insufficient low altitude weather observations are really largely responsible for uncertainty in microscale weather predictions and limits the application of microscale models. We can actually see in this graph here that a LIDAR um, was better predicting uh, the wind errors than the wharf was, and the wharf is actually a forecast model. And so, I'm seeing this side. Okay. Sorry about that. So, um, how do we solve this problem? So, we need to do it from the ground up. Satellites will not be able to resolve the low altitude weather challenges that we are seeing. And even more advanced ma machine learning techniques using same old data, this will not provide the insights that we need. Uh, we really require a ground up micro weather approach, leveraging novel observation networks like the Mesonet and coupling that with advanced modeling techniques. And this really requires a public private partnership, um, much like the COE is trying to do here uh, with ASRC, Mesonet and true other solutions as well. And so again, there's this low altitude opportunity and we're at a unique crossroads when it comes to low altitude weather. Um, the existing, again, the existing low altitude aviation weather gaps for current operators um, and there's novel weather challenges and sensitivities for the UAS and AAM operators. So here are an example of some sensors that we can go out and install to better detect the low altitude weather measurements. So deployment of these ground-based and mobile low altitude weather sensing technologies will address the weather gap challenge. Um, and even drone operators can report um, and get drone reports to detect the, the winds that are occurring around the drone. So we have a few examples here. Um, in the, the bottom here, uh, that's actually a weather instrumented drone. And so what they do is they will pilot the drone and the drone is fitted with different sensors on it. And you can get the, uh, the temperature, the winds, the pressure, the humidity, and these other uh, weather measurements from the drone as they fly it up above the ground. And they can fly that as often as they want. So this problem of the lack of low altitude weather observations is being addressed here right in New York State. Um, so the New York State Mesonet has 126 weather stations across the state. Each of these stations measures temperature, humidity, wind speed, and direction, pressure, solar radiation, and a few other weather parameters as well. And really the highlight here is the profiler network. Uh, they have 17 sites across the state. And what this does is provides additional atmospheric data in the vertical up to six miles above the ground level. And to highlight that National Academy of Sciences article, it says there's a need for atmospheric monitoring beyond what is currently available at mesoscale observation stations. Federal agencies and their partners should deploy ground-based remote sensing technologies to continually monitor conditions in the lower atmosphere. And the New York's Mesonet has done this. They've met this vision. So you saw these pictures before, but on the left here um, in the, these top two images, uh, the map, that's the 126 stations across the state. Um, and you can see the sensors that are fitted at each of those areas. And then in the bottom, we have uh, the 17 profiler stations that has uh, LIDARs and microwave radiometers, which are sensors that can detect winds and temperature uh, and moisture above the ground level, which is really key to filling those low altitude uh, observation gaps. And so what does True Weather Solutions does with, do with sensor networks like the New York State Mesonet? Um, what we try to do for our clients is we have a sensor plan. And what we do is we assess current available sensors within an area of interest that they will be flying. Uh, we identify gaps in the coverage. 
Uh, we recommend sensor solutions to actually fill those gaps tailored to their operations in mind. And we procure the gap filling sensors. New York State Mesonet is a great gap filling sensor network. And then there's this plug and play option where it's really easy to get these sensor networks into uh, a user interface that's easier for the customer to view. Uh, so we've done this in New York State and we have also done this in Ohio as well. And so addressing the weather pain points for these operators is really, a, it takes a multi-stepped approach. And so what we start to do is we engage with the pilot and the operator, um, and we really try to understand their mission and their workflow. Um, and that way we can ensure that the right weather data is plugged into these products to meet their specific needs to make sure that their operation and their mission can go off. And so this includes that weather gap analysis and the sensor placement uh, and sensor selection as well. And what this does is it helps us create the best weather intelligence for them in their area. Um, we can provide them observations through these sensor networks, um, provide forecast data as well to help them in their planning. Um, and then also it can be optimized using AI and machine learning as well. I know those are hot ticket items now. So, And then of course, with this weather intelligence, we deliver it in a way that makes it easy for them to understand, you know, they're getting a lot of data and how do they digest it and how do they use it to best fit their need. Um, and so we deliver it on a website, a user interface that we call um, for them to easily view. And they can also talk to our, our live meteorologist who can forecast for them. And so this is an example of what we do. Uh, really, we collect all of this data and we make it available on a user interface. Um, so again, this includes things like radar and a forecast and uh, lightning alerts and just alerts in general so that they know when um, there's going to be weather parameters and weather issues that impact their, their, uh, their specific missions. And then we have surface observations here, and that's where you would see sensor networks like the Mesonet. So it's all in one place for them to easily use and digest. And so what True Weather does is we offer this diverse weather data collection and the, this decision system to help enable a safe operating environment. And so really the, the key here is that for a safe and viable business model, uh, they'll need to anticipate changes in the weather at a micro scale. Um, and again, I'll, I'll keep going back to safety. We wanna make sure that these drones can operate safely. Um, and if they don't know what weather is occurring above the ground, it, it'll be very hard for them to operate the drone safely. Um, again, they're very, very small aircraft. They can be small, they can also be large. Uh, they're very, very sensitive to um, changing winds and changing icing conditions and changing cloud conditions as well. And so what we wanna do is make sure that for different drone operators that we can actually maximize their flight time um, depending on the drone that they're using um, and help to make sure that they're flying in nearly 100% of the weather tolerant windows. And so weather tolerant windows means that these drones and these operators, they have um, essentially thresholds and they have to stay below those thresholds. So they have these maximum wind thresholds and if they go above that, they can't fly. And so what we try to do is say, okay, you're going to reach this threshold between 2 and 4 p.m. So why don't you try and fly before 2 p.m. and get your operations done by then? Uh, we also try to provide enough lead time to alert them for upcoming no-fly conditions. Um, and we want to make sure that we can optimize the, the power management and the distance that they travel um, for each of their flights. Uh, so the batteries in drones are very sensitive to winds. So if they're flying against a headwind, uh, it'll, they'll actually use more power of their battery, which shortens their flight time. Um, so then again, we really want to optimize flight safety and enhance the ride quality and minimize passenger air sickness. So again, people, maybe one day we'll be flying on these unmanned taxis. Uh, and so we really, really want to make sure that we understand the, the winds and the turbulence that will impact the passenger comfort. So of course, we want to make sure that not just any data is getting out there. We want to make sure that the data is quality data. It's quality assured. It's quality checked. Um, it's, it's, um, safe from a security standpoint as well. Um, and so True Weather is working actively with the FAA uh, and NASA as well to make sure that these weather standards are set 
before the drone industry really uh, takes off, for lack of a better word. And so, again, these operations will not require the same highly tuned observations that regular uh, weather stations provide now. So instead, what we want to do is lever leverage more non-conventional sensors to capture a more complete picture of the weather con conditions in and around uh, urban areas. And so you can see the video now that's showing an urban canyon. Um, and so that's detecting the winds in and around different buildings. And so what we're doing is we're actually evaluating the capacity for these non-conventional sensors to support uh, drone operations. Um, and we're doing this in a, uh, a NASA funded test bed down in Virginia right now. Um, so NASA is funding this test bed uh, for us to conduct intensive assessment, um, intensive assessment, excuse me, for these non for how non-conventional sensors and advanced modeling techniques can be used to leverage and in increased depiction of winds through the urban canyon. And we want to make sure that we can improve the predictability of the winds and turbulence around these buildings as well. Um, and so this includes deployment of two LIDARs down in Virginia. Um, and what LIDARs do is they detect winds um, vertically and then also out and uh, around for a large radius. And you can see that radius here. Um, but again, I think with these test beds, we will, in order to really properly sense the weather in these urban areas, these will need to be deployed in almost every city. Uh, you can see that uh, this range is very limited. Um, and outside that range, you're really not going to be getting the same weather uh, insight that you would closer to the sensor. And so what these test beds do, um, and it can be done in New York State, it can be done anywhere, um, is to deploy these sensors, get the best weather intelligence and knowledge that you can um, to help these operators understand what's going on in the areas where they will be flying. Um, so we want them to know that if they are flying from one building to another, we can look at our sensors and we can say, okay, these are the winds between these buildings. You're good to go or you're not good to go. Maybe you should actually reroute and go this other way. Um, so we're working on having really tailored uh, weather products to help enable safe, um, safe flying in these highly dense urban areas as well. And so again, I, I kept this in here because companies like Boeing and entities like NASA are really interested in making sure that the, uh, the data coming out for the AAM and drone industry is really good data. Um, and they are continually working with uh, private companies and entities like FAA and others uh, to make sure that the, um, the, the, the data coming into this is safe, reliable, it's quality assured data and um, that it'll, it'll meet the need for these safe operations. And I, I know I say safe a lot, but that's a, that's a key word here, right? And so that's all I have for today. Um, thank you. Uh, that's my contact information. Feel free to email me with any questions you have, and I'll take some questions now too, if that's okay.